I always like sermons that have some audience participation. I always like it when we get to chat rather than you just get to listen. So uh, let me start off this morning with a couple of questions. Number one, uh, let me ask you this. What does natural gas smell like? Rotten eggs, Mary says, you're wrong. What, is, what does natural gas smell like? Nothing. Nothing, Bob says, you're wrong too. Or maybe you're both right. In fact, probably you are both right and you're both wrong, right? Depending on what you're talking about. If you're talking about the gas that comes straight out of the ground, it has no smell at all, so Bob's right. But if you're talking about the gas that comes out of the pipe at your house, it's been given a, a scent so that you can tell that you've, you've got a leak somewhere, so Mary's right. So either Mary's right and Bob's wrong, or Bob's right and Mary's wrong, or they're both right. Okay. So back to my original question earlier in the day when I was asking you about uh, salvation. Is it your job or is it God's job? And both is probably still the answer. Philippians chapter 2 seems to state that it is kind of a both answer, right? It's not a one or the other. And, and very much like my silly illustration about natural gas, if you choose just one or the other, you're missing something. You're missing one of the arguments. You're missing one of the perspectives. And so the Apostle Paul, when he talks about it to these Christians again, he says, My dear friends, as you've always obeyed, so there's something for them to do, they are obeying. As you've always obeyed in my presence, but much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now that phrase is really important because it is a direct command. You people, you brothers and sisters that I love so much, continue to work out your salvation. If I were to ask you today, what does that mean? How would you fulfill that commandment? What does that tell you to do? I'm going to guess most people wouldn't have a very solid answer. But there is something for us to do. We are responsible for working out our salvation. It is our job. That's what he says in the first part. But then verse 13 he says, For or but it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. So somehow God is at work in your salvation too. God is working in you and through you, and it's, in, it's by his power that his good purpose is going to get done in your life. And so how, whose responsibility is it to work on your salvation? Is it yours or is it God's? Well, somehow it's both. But that's the question. Not, not what, is, what is the answer, but the question is, how does that work then? How, does it, how is it possible that it's both together? A while ago, I came across an illustration that I thought was really good, and so I've adapted it for us. And maybe, maybe this will give you something to think about this morning, and maybe it will, it will help you work. My goal, my hope is, is that by the end of today, you've got something you can do that will help you work on your salvation. You'll know what to do. You'll know what your part is. This passage contains a, a promise, a power, and a command. And we'll see how those things work together very simply. Let's pretend Sarah's nice. Oh, wait a minute. I put the comma there in the wrong spot. Let's pretend Sarah's nice, and she comes to me and says, if you were really good this week in, in, in your job, if you get your work done this week, if you're done by Thursday at 4 o'clock and everything's finished and you pack a bag, we're going to Minot. We're going to go to Minot for the weekend. I booked a hotel and everything's set up, but you, you just make sure you're done and ready to go. If you were to diagram that out, you would, you would notice that there's a promise. The promise is we're going to go to Minot, right? We're, if we're going to go to Minot. That's what we're dreaming about. The, the power in this is that Sarah's already done everything that allows us to go to Minot. She has, she has gone to the bank and got the U.S. funds. She has made a hotel reservation. She's filled the car up with gas. We're ready to go. There, there's a promise and there's the power to get it done. And in between, there's got to be something that bridges those two things. There's one other thing that helps us get this finished. One other thing that helps make this Minot trip come together. And that is I've got to do something. Right? What do I have to do to make this all work? What's my part? Well, I've got to get ready. 
right? I've got to finish my work and I've got to pack a bag. Now, all of those parts are important, right? Each one of those parts is important for this promise to work out. If Sarah doesn't make the promise to begin with, then nothing happens. We just stay home this weekend. If Sarah doesn't have the power to make this work out, if she doesn't have the money for us to go, if she can't get a hotel room in my mind, if she can't, if she can't fill the car up for some reason, if there's a problem with our car, then we're not going anywhere, right? That doesn't work. She, we need the power to be able to do it. And if I don't get ready, then it doesn't work either. If I don't get ready, if I just refuse to go, then we just don't go. Or she throws me in the car and it's a kidnapping, then it's not actually a trip, right? <laughs> Um, all three parts, the promise, the power, and the command part, all have to work together for us to be able to go. You'll notice that they're not all equal. You'll notice that they're not all the same. Sarah has done the majority of the work, but there is something I need to do as well. If I don't get my work done, if I still am writing my sermon and I say, I, just got, I won't be ready for Sunday if we go to my lot, then we just don't go. I still have something to do, right? So, so there's a promise, there's a power, and there's a command involved in all of this. So how does that relate to what we're talking about today? Well, if you bring that to Philippians chapter 2 in the passage of Scripture we just read, the same structure applies. The same thing happens in this, in this verse. In this verse that the Apostle Paul writes, there is a promise, and there is a power, and there is a command. The promise is, and it's more readily found if you look just a couple of verses backwards, that the promise is of what's going to come. In, in the first 11 verses of this chapter, Paul's been talking about heaven and about, and about uh, our new home and about what Christ won for us. And he tells us to have the attitude of Christ so that we will be obedient like him and that we will end up in glory. The word glory is used a couple of times in, in the first 11 chap verses of this chapter. And so he's got them thinking about heaven and where they're going and all these sorts of things, right? And... and then he turns and he talks about the power to do so. So that's verse 13, that God is at work in you. God can make this happen. God has provided Jesus on the cross. God has provided his grace. God is not holding your sin against you anymore. God has made this happen. And so then, there is the commandment part, and we are to get ready. We are to work out our salvation. We provide our part. Now again, just like the very first example, our part isn't as big as God's part. My, my section of the promise wasn't as big as Sarah's. She did most of the work. And, as, and it's true in this case too. God has done most of the work. God has provided the sacrifice. God has provided the plan. God has provided the home. God is inviting you to come, but you still need to get ready. You still need to do your part. That's how you work out your salvation. You provide something that allows you to receive this gift, to receive this promise, to make yourself available to that power. You put yourself in a place to be blessed, and then it all works together. And if that were the entire sermon, it would be very short, and it wouldn't have taught you very much, because you've probably figured this part out already. In fact, right at the start, when I asked you who's, who's plan, who works to make our salvation happen, you've already said it was you. It was all of us. It was both. It was God and us. So you already know this part. Here's where the sermon starts to become useful. Here's where the thinking actually starts to help us. The question is, how? Not, not get ready, not work out your salvation, but the question is how? What are we supposed to be doing? What are we supposed to contribute? What are we supposed to give so that, so that we can be part of this promise and this hope and this power that God has given us? Now, your first knee-jerk reaction is likely wrong. Because my first knee-jerk reaction, maybe it's not yours, but I think it is because I've watched lots of people do it. My first reaction in, in the, how do I do this? I'm going to try hard. I'm going to do more. I'm going to be better. I'm going to work harder. 
I'm going to add a pile of things to my list. And so I see people doing this all the time. They want to work on their salvation. So what do they do? They start a Bible study here and they start volunteering over there. And they want to run something at the church here. And they're teaching six Bible classes. And, and, and they just tr they try to work it out. They try and do more and be more and be better and be stronger. And that's how I'm going to be saved. But what's the problem with that? Can't work hard enough. You can't do it. You can't do it. You can't work hard enough. You can't be good enough. You can't do it on your own. You can't make this happen. You can't work your way to being saved. In fact, that's what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 21. He says, I don't set aside the sacrifice or the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. He says, if I could have just worked hard enough to earn the promise, if I could have just been good enough to earn God's favor, if I could have done it by keeping the law, by being good enough, by being righteous enough, by being nice enough, then I would have done it, but I can't. And in fact, he says, if you're trying to do it that way, you're setting aside the grace of God. If you're trying to be good enough and trying to prove how wonderful you are, then you're, you actually, he says, you're setting aside the cross of Christ. You're saying, I don't need this. I can do it myself. And I think a lot of Christians get in trouble here because they think they've got to do it themselves. They've got to be good enough. They've got to be a certain way. And then when they can't, they quit. Or they give up. Or they just kind of lose interest. Because we've convinced ourselves that the way we get part of the promise is that we're going to be good enough. And we can never be good enough. But there's still that command. The command still says, work out your salvation. Do your part. Get ready. So if it's not about working hard enough, what is it about? What can you do? What are you supposed to be working on today? Because God's already done his part, right? He's provided the home, he's provided the cross, he's provided grace, he's given you the power, he lives in you, he's already done that part. So what is our part? Well, go back to my first illustration. If I'm going to get my work done and pack my bag, what is it that's going to make me do that? If I want to partake in the promise that Sarah has given me, what is it that's going to make me do that? What's going to make me do that is the fact that I am thinking about the promise she made. Right? Why will I go and pack a bag on Wednesday night? Because I'm thinking about going to Minot on Thursday. Why am I going to get my work done so I can leave at 4 o'clock and not think about it again so I can go on this trip? Because Sarah's made arrangements for us. She's already done all the work. All I've got to do is get there. So then I start thinking about the promise and the things she's done, the power that she's uh, used to get us ready for this. And, and then when I start thinking about those things, then I do my part. I become excited about my part because my part isn't the hard work part. My part is dreaming about going to Minot and going to Tractor Supply Company and Harbor Freight and doing all this stuff. Oh, and hanging out with Sarah too, right? My part is the dreaming about it, the thinking about it part. And when I think about it enough, then I make sure I'm ready so I can actually go. I want to suggest to you that that's exactly the same principle when it comes to spiritual things. That, that when we will become who we're supposed to be, we will be getting ourselves ready. We will be getting excited about it, not when we think about what good do I need to be doing. Not when I start thinking about the list of things I think I ought to be doing to prove how good I am. We will start becoming excited about our faith. We will start becoming interested in what's going on. We will start growing when we start thinking about the promises that God has made for us. When we start thinking about the power he has used to bring us home. When we start dreaming about heaven. When we start dreaming about what God's doing in our life and in our church. When we start thinking about the fact that he gave his son. When we think about those things, that's when we start becoming the people we should be. That's the part that changes us. That's the part that brings our salvation through us.
That's the part we can do. We can start thinking differently. I hate doing laundry. I hate doing laundry. I can't stand doing laundry. I don't like doing laundry. Kids have, and Sarah have all this stuff that I've got to hang up instead of dry, and I'm always worried about what I'm going to dry that's going to get shrunk and it doesn't work. And I, I just, there's always laundry to do, right? I, for years, I've hated doing laundry because it's just a chore, and it's just a, I've always got trouble because I'm always going to mess something up, and I'm always worried about what I'm going to do wrong. You know what, though? No, I've got a new attitude about doing laundry these days. I actually like doing laundry now. I actually, I actually kind of look forward to it. And you know why? Because I've stopped thinking about it as a job, and I've started thinking about the people I'm doing it for. Right? I've stopped thinking about this big pile of laundry I've got to sort and fold and do all this stuff to, and I start thinking about the fact that Sarah's working full time now, and she could use some help. I don't like laundry, but I like Sarah, so I see it differently now. Right? My thinking has changed. And my thinking has actually made me look forward to doing laundry, because it's not that I'm doing laundry, it's that I'm doing something useful. I'm helping. I'm contributing. And again, I think that's sort of the switch that takes place in our mind. That's, what's, that's what we've got to start thinking, because unfortunately, too often... We rush off to start doing something, and, 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 and we don't, we can't do enough. Or we rush off to do something, or we wait around until we feel like doing something, and then we don't do anything because we never feel like it. But it's not the doing part that's the starting point. The starting point is the thinking part. To make this as clear as I can, the key is that we must make room for reflection in our lives. We must make room to sit around and think about God's promises and his scriptures and what he's done. And we've got to spend some time, as the Bible tells us, to meditate on the word of God. We've got to spend some time doing that. We've got to make room for reflection in our lives so, so that we can think about what is really important. We take in a bunch of information, but most of us don't take time to evaluate it or process it well, and so therefore, it never changes us. It never changes us. And so we talk about God's promise, and we know about the cross, but it never really makes me think differently, or see anything differently, or be any different, or act any different, because I never really spend much time thinking about it, unless I'm here. And the key is we've got to start spending time thinking about the promises. The Bible calls it meditation. And when we actually start meditating on the things of God, when we actually allow God's promises and his power to just sort of shape our thinking, then we will start thinking differently. And when we start thinking differently, we will act differently. <coughs> Most of you know that in the summertime, I'm an official out at the Speedway. My job is to stand at the end of a wall with a set of flags. I let cars onto the track, and I watch corners number one and two to see who's making problems. It, it, who ran into who, who's got issues, who... I'm, I'm watching just for that. Lots of times at the end of the races, or the next day, if the races are on Saturday night, somebody will grab me on Sunday morning and say to me, who won the last race at the Speedway last night? And you know what? Most of the time, I don't know. Most of the time, I can't tell them who won the race. Why is that? I can't tell them who won the race because I'm not watching it as a fan. I'm not watching it and cheering for someone. I'm not watching it and counting who's going first. I'm watching it in a different way. I'm not watching it as a fan. I'm watching it as an official. And so I see the exact same thing everybody in the grandstand seeing, but I don't see it the same way. Because I'm thinking about it differently. I don't care who wins. I want to make sure it's fair. When you think differently about it, then you start seeing different things and noting different things. And, and I think that's what's happening in this passage. 
in this scripture, we're being told to start thinking about the things of Christ, dreaming about his promises and his power, because then you will have something else about you that is different. Something will change in you. In fact, the Apostle Paul at one point told another group of Christians that he's just praying and waiting for them until Christ is formed in them. That's what he wanted. I, I, I'm just waiting for the day. I'm going to be in labor pains until Christ is formed in you. And I think that's our part. You can't contribute to your salvation by making yourself good enough to be saved. You can't contribute to your salvation by making heaven somehow. You can't do much in your salvation, but here's what you can do. You can think about those things so much that Christ is formed in you. That Christ shapes your thinking. That every time you see things, you see it differently because you're not looking at it through eyes that everybody else has. You're looking at it now through eyes that Christ has given you. And you will then work out your salvation, not because you're trying to earn it, but because you're trying to live it. You're seeing everything differently. A guy named Richard Rohr one time said this, If you get the who am I question right, then the what should I do question tends to take care of itself. And I think this is the problem. I think, I think too many of us are asking ourselves, what do I need to be doing? What, what, do I, what can I do? Where can I start? No, no, that's not the question. The question isn't what can you do, the question is who are you? Who are you really? What, what is the bedrock of your life? What, what is it that makes you get out of bed in the morning? Why are you going and doing the things you're doing? Who are you? Paul says if you understand who you are, if you understand the promises that are coming, and you understand the power that has been made to get you where you are, then you will start understanding almost automatically what to do. <laughs> Spend some time thinking about who you really are. And then, the what do I do part will work itself out. It'll be obvious. In fact, Peter, Peter sort of hints at that uh, later on in his letter. He says, you have an answer ready. Have an answer ready when anybody asks you about your faith. Because it's going to happen if you're living your life of faith. You're going to get opportunities. Stuff, stuff's going to happen. But it's going to happen because we started by thinking in the right way. And we've been thinking about the right things. And those right and good things have shaped us and changed us. And so we don't see things the way everybody sees them. We don't value our lives based on the value that other people use. We're actually thinking differently. We're actually living a salvation life. And that's our part. That's what we can do. We can start thinking about the important things. That's the part we contribute. C.S. Lewis one time said, if Christianity is false, it's of no importance, and if it's true, it's of infinite importance. The only thing it can't be is moderately important. And I think for too many Christians, they treat it as if it's moderately important. It's just another thing. It's just something I do. I go to church. Paul's saying, I'm praying for you. Whether I'm with you or whether I'm not, obey the word of God and work out your salvation. Start thinking about the big things, the important things the things that really matter. Because in doing so, then your salvation will become real. John chapter 5, verse 24 has a hint, a hint of the same sorts of things said in a different way. John, this is Jesus saying, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins because they've already passed from death to life. How can he say that to a group of people who are still alive? They've already passed from death to life. Because they've listened to me. They're thinking about me. In their minds, they're already going home. That's how they have eternal life. Because it's in their hearts. And it's guiding them right now. It's making a difference because it's making them do the things they can do right now. 
Back to our first question. Does God save you or does Jesus, do you save yourself? God saves you. It's his grace. It's his son. It's his forgiveness. It's his mercy. It's baptism washing your sins away. It's his work completely. But you've got to put yourself in a place to be blessed by that. You've got to put yourself in a place where you live in that. And the way you do that is to think about what he's done. To think about the things he's given. To remember the promises. To start dreaming. Because that will change how you see everything else. And you will be living in your salvation. You'll be living eternity now. And you will work out your salvation in a way that is real. It won't be just something we talk about. It'll actually be who we are. And when we know who we are, we will know what to do. Let's partake of the table. morning as we take of the Lord's Supper, let us remember the promises that God has made to our Savior, and remember what our part is. Let us go to God in prayer for the day. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this time that Kim has reflected on, on what you have you have done, will do for us, and our responsibilities. We thank you for this bread that brings back in our minds the body of our Savior. That is as we partake in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus' name. Amen.